It's 9.38. You're with Lauren Laverne and I am delighted to say that I'm with today's guests. Patrick Boys, Neil and Chris, welcome. How are you? Very good. Nice Tired. to be here. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> Chris is just struggling through. Yeah. It's very early, this, really. It's ridiculous. Chris, anyway. Is, yeah. it, is this first, is this basically dawn for you? Well, no, this is getting up time, isn't it? This yeah. is, you know, moseying downstairs for a bowl of cornflakes But you're time. just moseying into our studio to chat to six music listeners who adore you. So we really appreciate you for making the it's time. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be here. And, you know, it's a big week, obviously. There's a lot going on. The new album is out tomorrow and it's the culmination of... Of a trilogy. Tell me a little bit about the about the story so far. Of this three records with the trilogy. Um, well, the trilogy has been made with Stuart Price, mm-hmm. um, who used to be in a Le Rhythm Digital, and um, he's also married to a manager. <laughs> so it's a, fa- a it's, family. It's affair. a family affair, <laughs> and um, we, on the spur of the moment, pretty much made an album with him about eight years ago or seven years ago, I can't remember, uh, called Electric. Mm-hmm where we had a load of dance tracks lying around and we decided to shove them all together. And for some reason, the album just turned out great. And we were doing interviews and I, on the cuff, off the cuff, I should say, announced it was the start of a trilogy. <laughs> and luckily <laughs> neither claim. Chris nor Stuart objected to this. And so we did the album Super with them, which was, so, so Electric was very dancey, mm. Super was more pop. And then on this album, Hotspot, we have a... St- studio in Berlin where we go and write and Mm -hmm. it's an apartment there and we suddenly thought why don't we get Stuart to come over to Hansa Studios I mean and and make something that sounds quite different from this sort of hyper digital pop we've been doing so tell me about that then Hansa Studios obviously a huge history how did the the history and the place that you were in make its way into the music well uh, they've got lots of very old analog keyboards just lying around. I haven't seen any of them before, actually. Never heard of them or anything. And so we use them. We use the old desk that they've got. Because so, normally you just, even if you're in a proper studio, as we call it, a proper studio, um, yeah. uh, you just tend to do everything through the computer, but everything went through the desk, and that gives uh, a is different that sound the as desk, well. Chris? I mean, is that the, the, I don't the, think the, it's the desk? desk or? I don't think it is, because the desk, the studio is on a floor below and it's now used for events so it's not used as a studio there's like you go downstairs there's a sort of cocktail party happening (laughs) um so we were upstairs in a but it was a very nice studio Mm -hmm. and and it's nice being in a proper studio um because you know the surprising things happen um stuart also did a thing where he put four speakers in the live room and put the drums through one, the bass through one, the keyboards through one, and the vocals through one, and then recorded it like a band. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. to get the ambience. <laughs> and so the album has got a very different, much more analogue. I know I can say that in six music. Yeah, well, you can. Um, a very, much more analogue sound mm-hmm. and than our previous records. It's, it yeah. actually sounds, although so it's, although it's part of a trilogy, it sounds totally different. And there's a lovely guitar contribution from Bernard Butler as well. The very last song we recorded, which actually we ended up recording in London, is called Burning the Heather, and Chris wrote the music for it. And you can now get a programme on Apple where you programme the chords in and a guitar plays it in perfect time and it's incredible it, it just, shouldn't be allowed it, just seems it really shouldn't be allowed it's shocking when you hear it <laughs> it really is um, so we got Bernard Butler who we've uh, met before to come and play guitar guitars. to replace the programme yeah and to put a bit of you know his own stuff in and that worked out really well, too, yeah. Yeah, you've also released an instrumental version of, of this album alongside. You will be releasing alongside the There's a the, the special regular. edition. Yeah. That came about, actually, not for dodgy marketing reasons, although it's sort of how it's ended up, but <clears throat> because the Japanese, I don't know if your listeners know, always need something else for the album. Oh? Because Japanese domestic records are more expensive than imports. Why they don't fix this, I don't know, but every time anyone releases an album, all other artists will know this, they say, and can we have two extra tracks for Japan? Mm-hmm. And so we suggested they had instrumental, and mm-hmm. it was all and it as well, it was all mastered. And then the Japanese didn't want that, but by that time we'd heard it and really liked it, so we suggested to our record company that we put it out. It's so nice- that's, that's a very nice sequence of electronic music with no annoying vocals from Neil Tennant. <laughs> well, and, no, uh, I mean, <laughs> but, but, you know, my question was going to be in, in follow-up to that, that, you know, are the, are the lyrics and the music kind of conceived separately? That The idea of them existing separately is quite interesting, especially, you know, with, yeah. with your background as a, as a yeah. journalist and writer first. Um, it depends. Sometimes in recent years, like Burning the Heather you mentioned, uh, a couple of years ago I sent Chris a load of lyrics I'd written 
thinking he might set them to music, and he did, which is quite nice. And um, but then often I write lyrics, we're writing music in the studio, and some some idea will come up, and I, and I'll write them at the time. Mm -hmm. What sort of subject matter have you been tackling this time around? What's been inspiring you? Well. Having had this apartment in Berlin for 10 years, some of the songs actually refer to Berlin. So the first opening track is called Will of the Wisp, and it's you're on the, the, U, the U1 underground line in going from Uhlandstrasse to Boschhausstrasse. If you get that the weekends, we, it's, it's a bit much like a party train, which it says in the song, because people get on with bottles of beer and stuff, and they're all going clubbing near Boschhausstrasse. And then the second one is about going out in Berlin on a summer's afternoon. People are, who don't know, but they always think it must be sort of grey and cold. And uh, actually, it's fantastic in the summer. It's got hundreds or dozens, anyway, of lakes mm -hmm. around it. And you can go swimming and, and, and get your bicycle through in the forest. And it's sort of about that. Yeah. Um, and what, uh, what about your reflections on the city, Chris? I mean, obviously, it's somewhere you know very well and have spent time in this apartment. I think you've had it for about 10 years or so. Is that right? Yeah, gosh, it doesn't seem like that. Um, well, it's a nice place to go to um, escape from the hectic life of living in London um, it's very slow the pace is much slower and um, it's a good place to work so you're not really troubled as much by things and uh, obviously we're in the same apartment so we can work longer hours and mm -hmm. work in the morning bef just after breakfast um, 11 o'clock 11 o'clock-ish <laughs> um, before going out for a cup of tea and a cake um, so yeah it's not it's just a nice place to be and musically you know, there's music everywhere they take music really seriously in berlin i mean any bar you go to there'll be a dj playing off a laptop playing really obscure stuff that you'd never heard before mm -hmm. and then there's well, it's no you know it's famous for its club so you go to berghain and so there's all those sort of influences as well so yeah. it's a nice place to be i'm going to play the track monkey business now which uh, you know we've had for a, a little while I've been sitting with that one and really enjoying it is there anything you can tell us about it before we hear it well we wrote this to the last album and, uh, and it came about because chris and i were in austin texas and we were walking down a back street going back to the hotel after lunch and a guy wearing a suit and a cowboy hat said hey are you guys the pet shop boys what are you doing here and i said we're playing a gig i said what are you doing here and he said me i'm here on monkey business just playing around <gasps> and i thought thank you <laughs> <laughs> Pet Shop Boys on BBC Six Music. This is Monkey Business. Neil and Chris, stay with me.
Pet Shop Boys and Monkey Business. The, f- the first time that that f- album version, we've played the radio edit, but the first time the album version has been on air, apparently. It is, yes. That was the, the world premiere first play. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> it's, got, it's a minute longer than the single version. I love it when you do one of those accidentally. Thank you yes. very much, gentlemen. <laughs> um, so, Neil, Chris, some statistics for you. Uh, 14 albums in, 100 million records it's 50, sold. It's 50 million. 50? Really? <laughs> I don't know where 100 million has come from. 100? So you think you, you're downgrading? I'm downgrading us to, to, to a mere 50 million. Now, don't yes. argue with the Guinness Book of World Records. You list you as the most successful duo <laughs> so of believe, all time. Yeah. And, of course, that 40th anniversary of, of you guys getting together is coming up next year. It so is, yes. the numbers are, are pretty interesting. And yes. I mean, it, it, it makes me wonder, when you started out, when going back to 1981, when you, know, you, you began on this project, if you could have known what lay in store... What would you have made of it, do you think? I think I wouldn't have believed it, really. Mm. Um, obviously, we didn't know them. But we started, as we've carried on, because writing songs together was was really good fun. And it was right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And right from the beginning, we both had different sets of skills in terms of music. I'd never actually really thought about a bass line before, to be honest. I used to write songs at home, my acoustic guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, and then suddenly Chris is playing a bass line on my synthesizer. And, and it was a sort of new world for me, that. Well, it was a monophonic synthesizer. There wasn't a lot else you could do, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. I mean, what about you, Chris? What do you think about, you know, looking back, obviously, when, I think when you come to these big anniversaries, it's an invitation to indulge in a bit of hindsight. Of course, I know that you guys are allergic to nostalgia, but you must kind of look back at, at, at the story so far and think that's pretty incredible. Um, no, I don't really. <laughs> um, I don't look back at all. Um I think the whole thing's just been a bit odd, really. Um, it's not what you expect to happen. Um, certainly not when you're at you know, university studying to be an architect. You don't expect to become a pop star um, yeah. and travel around the world. Um, but that, that aspect of it is very nice, actually, being able to travel. Well, because we won't be able to do that much in the future now either. So. And you are going to be travelling. You're going to be touring. Where are you most looking forward to playing? Well, we're playing in Britain. We're doing a tour of Britain. We start the tour in Berlin, appropriately, although that's just a coincidence, in fact. Mm. Um, It'll be nice going back there. Uh, We're going to be going to the United States later in the year. It's not announced yet. We're doing various festivals in the summer. Which is always fun. Various festivals in the summer? Various festivals in the oh, summer. I love yeah. those various festivals. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some listed on our website if you want to have a look. Okay. Um, um, and the tour is called Dream World. Yeah, we had a single out last year called Dreamland, mm-hmm. and we decided that we'd call it Dream World because it's a world tour. And maybe it gives an idea for the show. We've got a new design. We always work with a theatre designer. We've mm-hmm. got a new one because our previous designer, S. Devlin, is now doing Cirque du Soleil. Oh, wow. So okay. she's in Montreal and um, cooking that up. So we've got this guy we're working with. So it's going to be a fresh start. So that's exciting. Can you give me a, a, a sense no, of... What, not no, really. Clues, not really. It's too early. Not even any adjectives? I yes. mean, you know, could throw a vibe at me. Well, we're keeping, we're keeping the band that we had on the last tour because we like them. Mm-hmm. Like, we like, well, we like the whole thing that they bring to it, really. And also they're great musicians. And uh, so there'll be a band for the last show and, um, and then there'll be um, amazing visuals. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. We're That'll in. That'll do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll come. Uh, of course, you know, you, you continue to look forward and to try new things. Some really interesting projects for you guys in recent years. Um, the, the ballet score that you did in 2011, the Alan Turing concert a few years after that, and uh, the Royal Opera House residency. How do you decide what you fancy doing next? Is it just a case of following your nose and your instincts? Yeah, we've got this show opening actually in two weeks' time at the Leicester Square Theatre with Francis Barber called M- Music with mm-hmm. a K, German. And um, we took a character from the musical we wrote many years ago with the writer Jonathan Harvey. And Frances Barber's the most brilliant actor. And she inhabited this character so much, it just got a life of its own, the character. And we always wanted to do this one-woman show. And she's a, a singer from Berlin via New York, who's meant to have been famous in the 70s. And so she talks through her life, and we wrote songs for it. And that was a really fun thing to do, because you had to write 
songs from the past. So she has a disco smash recorded in Munich in 1978 mm-hmm. called Ich bin Music. And we had to write that. We kept playing Georgia Moroder's Music Machine album <laughs> to try and get the right sound. <clears throat> and it's and it's a really good song. Anyway, it's, a, it's only an hour long. It's a cabaret show, really. Mm-hmm. But it opens in a couple of weeks in London. Well, I'm very pleased to hear that you're not always resistant to looking back. If you could kind of no. look back and indulge in some, <laughs> some imagined nostalgia, to dip into a dream world. But with that anniversary coming up, 40 years next, I mean, you must have had so many invitations to to kind of celebrate that. Do you think you will? <laughs> we haven't had any. Really? I'm aware well, like what? <laughs> like what? I mean, forty years of. I you- think we'd be more likely to celebrate the first hit, mm-hmm. which was thirty five years ago. Mm-hmm. I think this year, but then thirty five years. It's a funny. It's a funny thing. I mean, we've reissued all our back catalogue in the last few years with bonus discs. Now the whole it's all. And interviews and everything—it's all, it's all neatly packaged up now. So I don't know. I think it's, it is best to look forward and let the past take care of itself in its neatly digitally remastered world. Mm. And what we tend to do is concentrate on what we're doing now and maybe know something's coming up in the future. And that's how time passes very quickly. I think when you do that. Well, we're maybe so- a BBC special on on you know. On BBC, BBC One Saturday night. Saturday night. Oh, that'd be now, good. Now, that would be yeah. good. Yeah. Strictly Takeover. A Strictly oh. Takeover. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. Come on. Well. Let's workshop this. It's, a, it's, a, it's essentially your Ruby wedding. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> strictly Takeover. That'll never happen. <laughs> well, we're certainly looking forward to tomorrow and the release of the new album. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us to nice tell to us about it. Nice to be here. Hot spot is out tomorrow. The Actually, it's quite place. late now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gentlemen, we get your coffee and a cake. You'll be all right, Chris. <laughs> 